<laughs> My name is Emmett McGregor. I'll be your host today, as always, uh, CEO of Sci-Fi Systems. Very excited to be joined by an amazing uh, panel today to discuss the high volume hydrocarbon extractor, the HVH50. Uh, we are joined today by Sci-Fi Systems Technical Director, John Mark Herring, uh, who's been pivotal in putting the team together, uh, forging our connection with uh, Scientific 710, our partners in this development program, and the original inventors uh, and developers of this technology. Specifically, uh, we have Clancy Callahan on, who is the engineer, inventor, and uh, tester of the system. The operator been running our prototype for, for quite a while now, getting all those kinks out. So welcome, Clancy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Clancy is also CEO of Scientific 710, uh, who has a variety of uh, hydrocarbon um, ancillary equipment. So uh, look out for both of us to be at MJ BizCon. Please uh, join us at our booth where we'll be presenting uh, the HVH50, as well as some Scientific 710 and other sci-fi systems products. So just wanted to shout that out. Uh, we are also joined by uh, Jason Robbins from the Scientific 710 team. Uh, who is their sales director. Hey, everybody. Glad to be here. Excellent. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. And, uh, you know, let's let's dive right in with the basics. Um, I think, you know, what everybody is wondering is, what exactly is the HVH50? Uh, and we'll get into some of the detailed specs, but, you know, from, a, from an overview of what you think, uh, you know, makes this a special extractor what's its purpose um let's go over to uh clancy to start us off you know how do you define what this system is so i think the major thing that's different about this system is the focus on um, throughput on just production is our overall emphasis um with uh, a real real focus on efficiency. We wanted to make a very efficient, easy to use system, um, lowering overhead specifically. So reduced labor, reduced personnel. Um, yeah, I would say that that's like the general, the general focus. Right. Okay, great. And John, Mark, uh, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, capacity, some introductory specs on the system that people I would like to hear about. Yeah, totally. So the HVH50 is currently sized to extract 50 pounds of bio per run. Um, we are using a specialized column design that eliminates the needs for tri clamps. Uh, it's on a mobile cart. So that workflow is greatly, um, it's made a lot more efficient for folks compared to traditional systems on the market. Every as or not every aspect, but most aspects of the system are pretty much re-engineered and completely unique compared to other units on the market. We've taken uh, you know, quite a bit of time and effort to optimize these processes, uh, which we'll get into deeper as the presentation continues here. But uh, essentially this thing generates a lot of vapor, low energy cost, extracts cold, and does what you need it to do with a very neat and tidy package. Great, thank you for that introduction. And uh, you know, for us to get into some detail here, I'll share uh, some images of the system, and we can take a look at some specific features. Um, so, this unit in particular, you'll see, is uh, it's a skidded system. Uh, it has uh, all everything that you need on board from uh, mobile extraction vessels that John Mark was just speaking about as well as color mediation, solvent recovery, uh, the solvent storage and handling, uh, your, your vapor pumps, your liquid handling pumps, vacuum pumps for vacuuming the system down. So this is really a comprehensive turnkey package. It also includes your heating and cooling utilities uh, that are not shown here because they are to be installed uh, outdoors. Uh, but we will get into some of the details of that innovation in heat management, which is a real core of this system. But just to show you an overview, here's an overhead view as well as a side long view of the system. And, uh, you know, we have run many, many hundreds, if not, you know, thousands of, of runs uh, of this system, uh, testing primarily with hemp, 
as well as other materials to validate the, the production capacity and the production workflow on this system. And so it's been incrementally improved over uh, months and, and years actually at this point. So let's uh, talk a little bit about what makes these extraction vessels and extraction approach unique. You know, we've seen for a long time that there's this sort of standard spool tri-clamp uh, type approach to hydrocarbon extraction in the cannabis and hemp industries. Uh, you know, we've really taken a new and novel approach to how these extraction vessels uh, are designed. Uh, maybe John, Mark, do you want to speak to some of the, the unique uh, you know, points on this that differentiates totally. it from the old. Yeah, and you know, the the big thing is obvious by looking at the column here. It's you don't see tri clamps on the top and bottom. You know, that allows us to get away or that allows us to use a column larger in diameter than a six inch column, um, as well as have a lot easier time opening the column from both the top and the bottom for loading and unloading biomass. Yeah, so this is the you know, 12 inch diameter uh, columns, ASME rated vessels. We have a uniquely designed uh, closure system for, uh, for quick closures on the top and bottom. Um, this, uh, these are two mobile carts that are included with the system. So not just one extraction vessel, but two. And then we'll talk about the biomass solvent uh, recovery system, which I have some questions for you on here shortly, uh, Clancy. So it's it's key that we are, there are two of these units included uh, with the model. And this is a, for those of you uh, looking at technical specs, this is a 70 liter approximately vessel. It's a little bit more around 73 liters. Um, so when we're looking at a 50 pound dry weight uh, inclusion into these columns, uh, that is with a, using a column packer, which is one of Scientific 710's specialty uh, piece of equipment they've been using for, for several years now to really maximize yield and minimize uh, channeling. So increasing your extraction efficiency overall, and especially increasing your per extraction operation um, uh, throughput capacity. Uh, because this system is C1D1 uh, approved. You do not need an H-class um, uh, unit or area to run it. So that's a key thing to understand. These vessels are ASME rated, 100% compliant for C1D1 in your F1, F2 zones, uh, just like any other hydrocarbon extractor you might see uh, that has been approved for use in uh, states across the country. And to give you a, a practical reference on that capacity, so that's a 12 by 42 inch column. So that would be equal in volume to four six inch diameter by 42 inch columns, but one. Yeah, and way easier to handle, you know, only two closures instead of, you know, having to handle each one of those closures individually with multiple bolts. Uh, these closures do have four bolts, uh, but they are optimized for ease of, um, you know, quickly dis uh, detaching them and torquing them appropriately. So uh, we really focused in on how to reduce the time it takes to load and unload the system, because that's really what bogs down a lot of operations or adds expensively more and more vessels to be in your, your uh, you know, loading and unloading zone. So uh, let's, uh, let's take a, a little few steps more down the tour of the system. Color remediation. This is, we have a really unique approach. Um, I know that. Don't mean to interrupt Emmett really quickly, but yes. I believe that you can refresh and you are going to get a slightly updated version that will have a little bit more for you. Oh, excellent. Thank you very much, Evan. Okay. Ah, excellent. Okay. Um, well, yeah, let's talk about this, the second extraction vessel, why it's so pivotal, uh, before we do move on to filtration here. Um, thank you, Edwin, for, for chiming in and, uh, and making sure that we cover this. Uh, so, you know, you could get away in a lot of systems with a single extraction vessel, and, and in fact, you could run this system with an extreme, uh, a single extraction vessel, but uh, let's talk about the, the biomass solvent recovery pain point and how we've been handling that uh, with this particular system. Um, do you want to speak to that, Clancy? Because I know you yeah. had a lot of work put into this. 
Yeah, sure. So when we fill, you know, when we have 50 pounds of biomass in one of those columns, um, to fill that, we're looking at in the neighborhood from 70 to 85 pounds of solvent, and that specifically speaks to isobutane. Um, and if you, so in the system, we're going to use nitrogen at that point to push the remaining uh, bit of that solvent for our flush, right? At the end of the flush, we're going to we're going to push that solvent out of that biomass. At that point, you still have about 30 pounds of residual solvent wet in that biomass. So that's our tandem column here um, scenario. One of that, so that column that just got processed, um, it's going to go and plug into a location where you we can we can pull that remaining solvent out so that we keep as much solvent in the processing system as possible for you know available for the next run so we're drying that solvent and at the same time if you're doing you know multiple columns at a time um, that you're you can soak your other column at that same time while you're drying your previous salt um, solvent so and we're seeing once once that happens, you know, we're so we're heating up all that solvent in there. Um, at that point, as everyone knows, you know, temperature is going to increase. We're going to get waxes and lipids. So we have an accumulator set up to capture that crude and keep it separate from our premium solute product. Um, so we we save all the that you know, remaining cannabinoids, waxes, lipids, all that stuff is going to go into a separate vessel during that drying process. And from that 30 pounds that we started with when it was wet, we're saving about 25 of those pounds. So at the end of that drying process, you're only left with about five pounds or so of residual vapor that's in in that biomass. And that... Right. that and essentially, I mean, you you could reclaim that. It just really depends on how fast you're processing, but you could get that remaining five pounds out if you wanted to. I mean, it's just going to take more time. Yep. And that five pounds left, you know, that is based around the, you know, 50 pounds an hour batch rate, as Clancy mentioned. If you want to get the rest of it out, you can uh, use the pump to get more out. It takes a lot less time than traditional pumps on the market. We have a vapor pump on the system. However, it's uh, it's not really, it's serving us mostly in this operation of uh, recovering that bio or that solvent from the biomass after extraction. Yep, and to give you a reference on that, um, this vapor pump that we're using, it'll do the capacity um, at a, if we're looking at like side by side comparison with say an MVP, if we're looking at a delta pressure of zero, we're talking about the capacity of about 10 MVPs at that point. Yeah. In, in one pump that's very quiet. It's about a 40, 45 CFM pump. Yep. And then it, on top of that, it has a higher maximum pressure output and a much lower vacuum capability. Yes, and this is the uh, that we're aware of. We're the first to use this type of uh, vapor pump, uh, and it is extremely uh, impactful, especially on this scavenging step, but also on the last stages of solvent recovery, which we'll come to uh, shortly. But uh, one thing to emphasize here is that you know, in smaller operations, your gas waste isn't necessarily considered all that much of a concern. But when you're running an operation here, where you uh, could be running um, you know, several hundred pounds of, of production throughput, about thousands of pounds of production throughput a day, um, saving, you know, 25 uh, pounds of gas per run uh, at an approximate cost of, say, $6 per pound, um, you know, you're seeing some serious savings uh, run on run, and not only savings on the actual gas, but also on the amount of gas you have to handle in your facility. So in some jurisdictions where you may be quite limited in terms of the total volume of isobutane, butane, or propane that you can handle in your facility at a given time without having to have special additional certifications. Uh, bringing that solvent uh, reclaim from your biomass uh, into focus was a real emphasis for us to help out those operations and 
and keep the amount of gas you have to keep bringing into the facility to a minimum. As, as well as, you know, we're opening a, a column with 30 pounds of solvent in it, even in a C1D1, it's, uh, it's, it's not the safest situation. Um, so this, you know, greatly increases the safety of the operation as well as saving costs. Yeah, and you can see it wouldn't be, it wouldn't take much math to figure out, you know, use a system says, okay, you know, say, say like a, for us, for example, you know, we say, okay, we're 50 pounds an hour, right? But is anyone asking the question of for how many hours can you run that before you run out of solvent? Cause all your solvents stuck in your biomass still, right? So we address that question in this design and we tried to optimize as best we could to, to prolong that 50 pounds per hour for as long as we could before we do, you know, eventually need to add solvent to the system. You know we're losing five pounds per run so that's that's really good excellent all right well let's uh let's move right through the features here going to our color remediation section we have a pretty unique and full featured approach here i know uh john mark you were pivotal in some of this early development you want to uh, walk us through what the uh, included equipment yeah. is here yeah so you know in the cannabis space, um, using uh, solid mineral-based sorbents is, has become very common in recent years, um, often uh, dubbed CRC, uh, which we've taken a different approach here. And over the past year and a half, I guess, there are new sorbents coming on the market that are granular instead of clay-based, which are powdered, right? Um, but I'll start with the CRS-1 module, which is the larger tank that's clearly visible in this overhead view and this is where we took a very unique approach to color remediation and you know given that using clay sorbents to remediate color is an inherently a, a mass transfer dominant process we took a different approach to this than a column uh, instead we have a tank that is agitated or it's a recirculating slurry based process and that allows us to agitate, get that mass transfer, as well as instead of a flat center disc, like many people on the market are using, we're using a depth filter. And that allows us to filter and remove that decolored mixture from that process at a lot faster rate than if we were taking the two dimensional flat land approaches, I like to call it. Now, you know, given the new adsorbents coming on the market that are granular based, uh, you know, different operations, different end products, uh, you may want to use a different type of absorbent. So we've added the CRS2 module, which is a parallel um, or a configured column-based uh, filter for those granular-based sorbents. You can bypass them or you can use one or the other. And if you're in another industry besides cannabis and decoloring is not, you know, needed, the CRS-1 serves as a tank that, you know, allows you to do liquid refining as well. And, and that is something to emphasize here is this platform, of course, cannabis and hemp is the, the big focus for us, uh, but we've already seen cross applications of the, this technology to other uh, botanical extraction um, and generally organic matter extraction industries. Uh, so the we really tried to optimize for multiple use cases and flexibility, give the operator the opportunity to make the decisions about how they want to run uh, their process, even in cases where we have been building an automation um, and you know, electronic controls using our PLC, we want to make sure that it's up to the operator to refine their process to run it exactly how they want. Um, so a, a key part of this, having both a uh, agitated tank and pass through column based filters really gives uh, the operators the maximum flexibility. So let's keep on uh, going here and go to, to solvent recovery. This is a huge area of innovation uh, for the system. Um, Clancy, do you want to talk a bit about um, you know, synthase? What is synthase uh, and how is it being applied here uh, in the solvent recovery section? What makes this unique? Yeah, okay, that's that's kind of a two-part question. So it's uh, synthase is our heat management system and the way that we move heat around into the system. And then the second part of that 
is kind of the heat transfer components of that specifically on with a focus on vapor generation. Um, that's kind of the, the starting place for your solvent recovery. We want to generate, we want to focus that energy, that heat that we're producing, and we want to use it to produce as much vapor as quickly as possible. So in a lot of standard um, systems, traditional systems across the board, um, you know, heat transfer is limited um, by surface area, you know, jackets, stuff like that. So, um, and the consequence of that is you're, you're heating up all of your solvent at once. You're getting some convection in there. Vapor is, is getting produced and then it's getting recondensed to a liquid. So ultimately what you're doing is you're trying to heat the entire volume of solvent and you but the, the end result, what you want is you want vapor production. So we, we have, um, you know, some intellectual property in that, in the heat transfer system to where what we're doing is we are kind of bypassing, if you will, the heating of the liquid um, as a whole. So we're heating parts of the liquid and using the vapor that's produced from those smaller parts of liquid and uh, bypassing the rest of the liquid capacity that would normally condense it back to a liquid and releasing that vapor immediately for, uh, for recovery. Excellent. You can see here, you know, we're getting a really strongly agitated uh, boil uh, in the vessel here. This is even an earlier uh, mode of operation in this video. So we're able to very tightly control and get extremely strong uh, currents of flow within the, the uh, agitated flow and then very high uh, uh, surface contact area and uh, you know, mass flow through the system to really get that vapor uh, out of the, the massive liquid. And uh, what rates are we seeing as far as recovery uh, in the, the pilot unit and, uh, and what, are, you know, what are our targets for the commercial unit? So in our pilot system, um, we've been operating for just over a year and a half, um, and we are consistently getting seven to eight pounds of, uh, of recovery on that. Um, and that is using, that's about our six horsepower unit that we've been, you know, using for R&D. Uh, with the HVH, we're gonna upscale that to a 10 horsepower unit. Um, so we're looking at in the neighborhood of, you know, 10 to 12 pounds a minute. Um, and one thing, so right there, when, when people say that, you know, the first question in my mind is there's all these other factors that dictate those recovery rates that aren't talked about um, in the industry. Like what, you know, okay, that's your recovery rate. That's great. What, at what delta pressure is that? At what temperatures is that? And we all know, you know, those of us out there turning valves know that, you know, when we use colder solvents, those numbers change. When we have higher pressure deltas, you know, those numbers change. So, so that's those conditions that we're seeing that are at a solvent temperature of 20 Fahrenheit. Um, which is, you know, uh, every, everybody's running different temperatures for different things, right? Are you doing crude or you're doing, you know, diamonds, how much wax and lipids can you get away with? Um, or how much do you want? So, so that, that's and the stats at running at 20 Fahrenheit solvent temperature. So as well you know, as with any solvent, uh, whether it's normal butane, isobutane and propane, the system operates uh, because it's a passive recovery. Um, yes. And we have, uh, you know, configured some special check valves for the application that really have almost negligible pressure drop across the valve um, and do a great job at keeping, you know, the evaporator condenser side, uh, you know, as discreet as possible um, while maintaining that flow path uh, you know, the propane 
well, you know, the condenser side is just going to run at a little bit higher pressure. You know, of course, the vessels and all this are you know, certified and designed to, to be safe at these pressures. But, you know, a lot of people like to, you know, give their numbers based on one solvent. Uh, you know, we've managed to design this so that you can achieve these rates at, you know, with any solvent you're going to use you know, that's a light hydrocarbon. Yeah. Yep. So I, he I hear that there's a there's a vapor pump, uh, but there's also this passive recovery concept. You know, how can you explain a bit about how the vapor pump is involved in the solvent recovery process? Yeah, the vapor pump, um, its main goal, its main task is in the bio drying process. So so after the nitrogen flush of the bio, the, that's when our vapor pump really shines is is coming in it's heating up that biomass um, and then we're we're backing that down uh, while that heat is in there as low as we can you know to get to put all that solvent no longer in use back into use you know back into the system where it belongs so that's that's the focus of the vapor pump and that would be, you know, what we would call the active part of the system. Um, the mm -hmm. passive part of the system is specifically um, tasked with doing the bulk of the solvent recovery. And can those two systems operate at the same time? They can operate at the same time. Um, the the advantage there would be they don't always have to operate at the same time for sure. Um, but the advantage, if you do, so you're still going to do the bulk of your solvent recovery passively, um, but you can do a passive active system. And the active part of that would be a complement to the bulk load of the passive where it would, the, the benefit there would be to allow you to reduce the boiling temperature uh, by way of reducing the boiling pressure in in our 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 reclaim or not reclaim but in, into the next vessel that we're going to talk about which is our recovery vessel so you can drop those boiling points the effort there would be to to keep terpenes in your solute as much as possible specifically for customers um, after diamonds and sauce and just heavy terpy products yeah, to, the, and, to that point, uh, can this one run live resin? And, and John, maybe you have some additional points you want to cover. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can run live resin in this unit. You know, you're just probably not going to, you, you may not elect to use your column packer, depending on how your live resin workflow, your material prep, you know, uh, is designed. But yeah, you can totally run live resin in the unit. And it can, you know, we can go as low as, you know, negative 40 with uh, solid temps. Uh, as everything, you know, it's hard to, like Clancy mentioned, it's hard to give, you know, encompass all use cases, but, uh, you know, high volume extraction and vapor generation and recovery are the key points that, you know, should allow anybody to assess the speed of the unit for any type of operation. And, you know, our number of 50 pounds an hour, that is, you know, based on a moderately chilled solvent temperature uh, to make, you know, end products that are Dabbable after the uh, oven, usable to the consumer. You could go faster than 50 pounds an hour, um, even if you're making crude, which is where this unit really comes to compete against uh, other solvents commonly used for, you know, like ethanol. Uh, that's maybe we can elaborate more on that side later. But um, yeah, that's the gist of it. Yeah. And with, the, you know, our goal, our whole team, you know, what we're, we're, focused on not you know we're, we're giving we're answering the questions people aren't asking and should be um we don't want to give false expectations or oversell anything so we, we're trying to be full disclosure with everything um so like on for example you know with fresh frozen we we have a packer and what that is it's a, it's a hydraulic packer it does twenty thousand pounds of force if you have something compressible that's a huge advantage. So like dried and cured, um, you know, is highly compressible. So we can, we can really um, accelerate the production by putting considerably more amounts of biomass into the same volume chamber. 
that has a lot of benefits, uh, reducing channeling, um, just, you know, overall, you're doing more biomass per run. Uh, when we get into fresh frozen, you know, using the packer, like, like John was saying, it's, it's what, you know, fresh frozen has a lot of water in it. And we all know that water is incompressible. So you're not with the using the packer on fresh frozen, you, you wouldn't really have much of an advantage of using it to pack fresh frozen. You might as well pack that by hand. You, you might get 2% more or something biomass in there, but you know, so the, there's not a huge advantage there, but the advantage in fresh frozen and using the packer is the unpacking, right? Cause it's all packed in there. It's super cold, but you could use that, you know, to, to get it all out of the column with the push of a button, which is really nice. Right. In, general, the oh, in general, if you, you know, a lot of people have to pre-freeze their columns. Um, I mean, you could roll these columns into a freezer, totally up to you. Um, but we do have a feature here, you know, uh, extractors out there that hear that there is a 40 some odd uh, CFM vapor pump that uh, exists on a system, their minds will immediately uh, turn to the idea of, oh, wait, you know, I reduce pressure on, you know, light hydrocarbon and it gets colder. And that is another feature here, a feature set. We've made this as adaptable and versatile as possible, but uh, you can flash cool uh, using that vapor pump as well, uh, you know, using the biomass as a, an expansion uh, device of sorts. Right, so actually going, uh, starting with warm biomass and then using your solvent to cool without extracting at the warmer temperatures, but then immediately once the temperature reaches the right target point, then going into an extraction run. Yeah, and that's actually all part of the automation package too. Uh, so it's something that you could, you know, we did uh, manually, uh, take some finesse and, you know, takes, it's a, it's a lot more work uh, to get right manually. Uh, especially for new uh, extractors, especially new to a, a new system too, right? So that was one of the reasons that we leaned towards automation here is to make some of these things as easy as possible and reproducible as well as efficient um, there as well. And, you know, just to touch on the automation a little bit more, I know we're going to go into that a lot more later, but, you know, you've got process monitoring and metered mass flow feed of solvent with a liquid pump into your column. So if you want to extract dynamically, static, soak, thin dynamic wash, however you want to do it, it's doable and it is repeatable, trackable, traceable in the HMI PLC. Great, well, we'll continue to unveil some additional key um, uh, features on the system and differences from common operation, but why don't we move from solvent recovery uh, and into the, the sort of second half of the solvent management system, uh, talking about how solvent condensing, uh, uh, purification, and storage uh, is handled. Um, so that's, you know, we've already talked a little bit about biomass uh, solvent recovery, but after the vapor is generated in either the solvent recovery vessel or uh, in your biomass vessel, you know, what does the vapor path look like and how, you know, how are we handling the vapor to make sure there's uh, true pure gas returning to the solvent storage. As, as Clancy touched on there, uh, we have a, a separator vessel. Um, now this separator is not just a, a pot to, that slows down, you know, the velocity and drops out droplets. It's also, you know, got some heat added to it as well. So it serves, you know, to, you don't slow down. You don't, cause you know, that solvent mixture coming out of the bio column during re reclaim mode, at least, is uh you know it's it's got it's it's wanting to condense it's uh you know it's it's ready to condense and in that you without heating that vessel you could easily end up with a, a, a sludge that has a lot of solvent left in it and more time to get that back into the condenser and liquefied ready to extract so you know with the design of this vessel uh it, that's not a bottleneck at all hardly know it's there yep. yeah so this is actually a sort of like a second stage of evaporation in this um 
you know, we call it like sort of a crude catch vessel or the separator vessel here. Um, and uh, Clancy, do you want to speak to, you know, how the vapor path goes uh, following that and how we're condensing the gas? Yeah, specifically to the separator. To and from the separator and in, into the yeah. uh, solvent tank? Yeah, so that the separator, um, so what we've done in there is mainly it's uh, centrifugal separation. So there's a cyclone inside of that um, and any any unwanted droplets, and those could be lots of things that could be terpenes. Um, there could be, um, you know, wax, heavy oil, lipids, wax. heavy oils. Yeah, and some of that is solvent as well that'll go down and get reboiled, kind of like a reflux operation. So that whole thing is is a separatory vessel or accumulator that ensures that we are just pulling off the fresh solvent that we want back into our solvent tank and leaving everything else remaining. Um, there's even as far as an entrainment separator on that. So even the very, very fine um, droplets that might work their way up into um, the, the vapor out where it would be headed back, they're, they're even trapped again there and brought back down into that vessel. So the goal is to, to rid ourselves of the bulk of the moisture, waxes, lipids, any unwanted. Um, and then, you know, we're going to clean that again through submulsives and just to ensure that that solvent in the solvent tank stays as clean and fresh and conditioned as possible for the next run. And you can see here this, uh, this horizontal vessel uh, in the piping, I believe you can see my mouse that's at the at the top of the vessel that you know we've sized the um, emulsive uh, container to be appropriately sized to handle all of the flow and also to not need extremely frequent replacements it's a it's a balanced size where you're going to be you know running shifts. Um, uh, before uh, having to change out your emulsive so that's a key item when you're handling this much gas and, and cycling it this many times. Uh, we really want to keep it dry and make sure it's pure going back to to your solvent uh, condensing and storage stage so let's talk about condensing and, uh, and storage and, uh, and you know solvent temperature control that's a little bit different for this system um, you know john do you want to speak to that yeah so it's uh i like to call it the stc uh, solvent tank condenser it serves as a storage tank as well as a condenser. And not only are we condensing, we are subcooling that back to your desired set point that is controllable in the automation system here. It's all tied in. And I'll let Clancy describe the uniqueness of this uh, you know, condensing area. Yeah, and one other thing that that's doing is also maintaining that solvent temperature over time. So in between runs or you're out of town for two weeks or or whatever. So it's, you know, it's maintaining it. It's it's handling all of our phase change from vapor back to a liquid. Um, it's doing quite a bit of stuff there. And that there's some IP in there that's um, not in standard refrigeration at all. And again, just like the previous heat exchanger that we talked about in transferring heat for our other phase change going from liquid to vapor, um, that is unique and operates very efficiently and effectively in producing vapor very fast. Um, this vessel here, our condensing vessel, same thing. We're, we're really focused on on separate parts of that system so or stages so the first thing we want to do is take that vapor condense it back to a liquid um, and then second we want to transfer that liquid temperature and make it consistent throughout the entire solvent tank so you're not dealing with you know a delta 20 degrees between the top of your solvent tank um, temperature and the bottom of your solvent tank temperature. So we're further mixing in there, making sure that the temperature reading you see is the temperature throughout the entire vessel. Um, so you're good to go. When you, when you flush that for your next column, you have a very consistent temperature in that. Yeah, a lot of work has gone into 
you know, managing the heat and where that heat is and where it goes and how it's used, uh, economizing heat transfer. Um, it's, it's hard to see from an overhead view. We'd have to cut the tanks open and, you know, show you that view, which, you know, maybe we can here in the coming months, um, you know, to reveal more of these details, but uh, we do want a little bit of a head start to market with these um, because you yeah. know, they, they apply beyond the Synphase heat utility itself. It's, uh, you know, also just condenser design. Yep. Yeah, um, we've, we've really, you know, our first thing is just going through standard systems and identifying weak points, you know, and a lot of those weak points in production overall are in the heat transfer side of, of systems. So that was a large focus for us is, you know, we have all this available energy, let's apply it, use it as fast and effectively as possible. So no you know, no heating up a large amount of low thermally conductive material before it gets to this huge body of liquid. And then we're finally generating vapor. You know, we want to use that energy straight to vapor production and then straight to liquid production. Excellent. Well, thank you for that, uh, for that explanation. And um, I I believe, uh, so we're at the end of the, the presentation, but there are a couple of questions that I want to make sure uh, get answered for, for the clarification of everyone listening. So we've talked a little bit about pumps. Uh, you know, we've talked about a vapor pump. Um, it, I think it should be clear to everyone that there are, there's a separate hydrocarbon vapor pump and a vacuum pump for pumping down your system, getting atmosphere out of the system for safe operation. So those are two split individual units um, so that uh, we have an absolute safety rating. This whole system is rated for C1D1 environments, uh, but exceeds the safety uh, sort of precautions that have been performed uh, uh, on other Great. similar type systems. And, and John, do you want to speak about that process? Yeah, I do. Yeah, real quick. Uh, you know, a system this size, uh, there's a lot of systems on the market uh, that are not even using pressure relief valve headers, uh, whether the manufacturers are intending for the users to do that, or I, I don't know why this is commonly seen out there on the market. Uh, I've walked in many a C1D1 booths to find PRVs with open ends pointed directly at the operator's working area. Um, so, you know, we've, we've worked with a oil and gas uh, EPC firm to, you know, help us make sure this system sets a new standard for safety of hydrocarbon extraction system on the market and uh you know one of the most glaring obvious uh pieces of that work has been the pressure relief management you know to exhaust safely away from the operators uh, and that's just one aspect that those guys have helped us greatly with here but it is you know it's, it, it's one of the glaring issues of safety on extractors on the market as well as everything, every line, every flow path thing, uh, you know, able to be grounded very well. Because that's kind of key to. Yeah, and that has off too. Yeah, we went I, through a, a has off, um, which I don't know. I don't know if any other hydrocarbon extractors on the market are, you know, at that standard. But has off is a, a process. Um, I believe it's under OSHA. It was a pretty intense three, maybe, yes, yeah, three days of, let's see, the sci-fi team and the EPC team. Uh, we had mechanical, chemical, electrical, you know, all members represented at the table and went through almost like a war games uh, situation analysis of what happens if this, you know, breaks or, you know, loss of containment here, what happens? So that also informed the design of the model you see on the screen here. And that's a documented process as well. Right. So for OSHA reviews, we can provide a proof of HAZOP analysis for the system. Uh, we think that in certain locations, that's going to be increasingly important. We, it's also worth saying that the system will be peer reviewed uh, for uh, all 50 states. 
So this will be available for your jurisdiction if you're within the United States. If you are um, outside of the United States, we are eager to work with our international uh, clients to uh, find a regulatory standard that meets your requirements that may need to, in the short term, be a custom uh, engineering uh, process to make sure that we uh, conform to all of those specific standards for your international use case, but that is absolutely a goal for this system. Um, so if you're in one of those uh, difficult jurisdictions out there that makes it really hard on us hydrocarbon extractors to get approved, just know Scientific uh, 710 Sci-Fi Systems and our engineering partners, uh, both peer reviewing and design engineers are all in your corner ready to uh, you know, fight the good fight with the uh, authorities having jurisdiction over your facility. Uh, so do we uh, think that there are any other key operating uh, factors that we want to uh, touch on before we go to Q&A? Hmm. So um, I, I will note a couple of things that might, people might ask about. Um, we've mentioned nitrogen in the system, but also we've mentioned liquid pumps. Uh, so maybe we should talk a little bit about nitrogen handling and, uh, and liquid flow handling. Well, the nitrogen use is greatly minimized. Um, and you know, some users may even find it easy for them to get away from nitrogen in this system. Uh, but overall for you know, general use cases that people are most commonly uh, performing out there, the nitrogen use is greatly reduced by one using liquid pump. But uh, it's only use here is pretty much to push the liquid that final bit out of the column as well as you know out just clearing vessels um yeah right and what one thing that, you know that was important to me is i've been in a lot of labs um and sound you know and we all know the pumps out there and you know the rat tat tat it just i'm one of those people <laughs> that it just it kept my work environment you know it's like if I go to fast food, I go to McDonald's, you know, I always hear the, the, when the fries are done, you know, the beep, beep, there's just beeps and it just, it drives me crazy. And in labs, it's no different. I hear the pumps and it just sounds, uh, it's, you know, the it's work environment. Yeah. Work environment is kind of a big deal. I mean, all the way down to the lighting and the environment and all that stuff is important to me because these operators are living there. You know, I mean, we're, we're working day in and day out. So making that environment comfortable um, is a big deal to me as far as do you want to go to work? Or do you have to go to work? And this system, um, we emphasized on noise, you know, so we really wanted, we wanted a friendly system here, you know, that's quiet um, and calming. And so you yeah. can focus on the things you need to focus on and, and get your work done without having this conscious agitation going on. As well as you've got a lot of other systems on the market, there's a lot of movement, uh, you know, physical movement, manual labor involved, just turning valves, moving from here to here, looking, checking this and that. So the layout as well is, you know, it's ergonomic for the workflow. And, you know, some of the systems still on the market, there's a lot of hoses and, you know, just obstructions to that workflow that, you know, can vary depending on the install location or are just completely movable. So uh, maybe they were not intended to be in the work path, but they often end up in the work path. So, you know, this thing drops into your C1, D1 and it's modular, it's neat, it's clean. And that is, uh, that was one of the aspects we emphasized here in terms of workflow and workplace safety. Great, and uh, Jason, uh, do you have any uh, key points that we may have missed uh, here that you want to cover? Uh, no, I just want everybody to realize, you know, uh, you know, we've specialized in, uh, you know, solving bottlenecks um, with all of our products. And this is kind of just a masterpiece of everything coming together. Um, we want uh, our clients to get the most um, out of their equipment. Um, no wasted motion, um, solving bottlenecks. And, uh, just doing things uh, the way we think um, should be done. Um, and a lot of that's being proven correct with a lot of the data we've been able to accumulate uh, over the past year and a half and, and just really apply everything 
as far as even our ancillary equipment to our to this extractor and everything yeah. really works together in harmony to um, produce the most efficient extractor on the market. And it's, uh, you know, like Jason said, the data and, you know, this is an introduction to the HVH 50 and here, you know, in the near future, um, we will have to do a round two to go through some of that data, you know, to show the process that we've been through over the past year and a half um, of gathering data, testing, trial, error, um, you know, to get where we are today. Uh, we've collected a lot of data that is, we have not seen anybody at least sharing. We're pretty sure has not been collected at all to, you know, confirm assumptions as well as, you know, debunk some traditions that are common uh, in this industry in hydrocarbon extraction that are just artifacts of, you know, every, all of our uh, early starts, you know, when all this started years ago. Yeah. A lot of out of the box thinking, trying a lot of non traditional things. Um, and in that process, we collect data and we look at the data to tell us whether or not that's a viable pursuit we don't just you know it starts with a thought hey i think this you know reciprocating this the solvent through the biomass you know i think that would be a great idea well you know let's instead of just making a product and selling it to people and letting them figure it out let's make it ourselves let's try it ourselves the data says you know it's it's not that viable of an idea so okay let's throw that out let's move on and try to tackle it from a different angle you know so we're everything in this system has been tried has been proven we have data to back it up and it wouldn't be on the system if we didn't think it was relevant yeah i think uh you've probably gone through at least four heat exchanger designs that have been built tested for weeks if not months at a time and then improved upon to arrive where we are at today on both the cold side and the hot side here. Yep. Yep. Entire system has been torn down and rebuilt many, many times <laughs> and all parts of it to, you know, really optimize. And so uh, I, we're coming in on uh, the close of our hour here. I want to highlight a couple of items that we touched on. Uh, that we're going to have to expand on more in the future, but know that uh, the system does have uh, a great degree of automation and control through the explosion proof C1 D1 rated HMI and control panel. So a lot of these valves that would typically need to be turned manually can be turned at the panel. Um, there are sight glasses on the tanks so that you can double check uh, your information about what's going on in those tanks. But we tried to put in as much relevant sensor data into the HMI so there's as little uh, guesswork and running around as possible to make this an ergonomic process for the operators. And we believe that this system can be readily operated at that 50 pound per hour rate uh, with no more than two operators. And in fact, it has been run with a single operator many times, but uh, two operators for, for safety and best workflow um, is optimal. So and that 50 um, pounds an hour is not a crude number. That is a that is for a usable product after solvent recovery, after the vacuum oven. Yeah, you, you don't have to divide that one by two to get practical data. <laughs> yeah. And then were you guys going to touch on the power consumption or are you going to save that for a later date? Oh, well, it's uh, we're yep. pretty confident it's late, less than anybody else on the market. Although, you know, folks are out there improving the process. It's a great time for hydrocarbon extraction and extractors. We are entering a whole new era um, where, you know, relics of the past are going to be relics of the past. So it's a great time in this market. And power consumption, you need about 40 installed amps. And that is installed. That's not your, that's not running. Running amps, of course, depends on how you're operating, but it's much less. Yeah. That's and the 483 phase. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and that's, you know, we're, yeah, we're likely less than that, but that's a good, good place to be. We don't, we're not trying to oversell anything. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer, so the, the efficiency part of this is, is very exciting to me, um, but as a processor, maybe not so exciting, but what is exciting is what that means is higher production, period. You know, and the more margins efficient. out there are getting slim on all markets. Um, and, you know, 
one of the big things here is operating costs. Uh, if you're using consumable or ex uh, expendable coolants, uh, you know, like dry ice, CO2, you know, that has a large cost associated with it. If you're using, you know, extremely large chillers that go, you know, below negative 40 or, you know, ultra cold, that is a huge expense um, as well and just inefficient. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we've replaced a lot of that uh, for a much better way to move heat. Yeah, and I do, one last thing I just want to emphasize is uh, when people are out there shopping around at different systems, one question um, that should always be asked that is some sometimes but not often enough is when you're, you price an extraction system, you know, and you, you get the expectation that, okay, it's going to be, you know, X amount. Um, don't forget to ask about all the ancillary equipment that's not included in that cost, right? All your heaters and chillers and, you know, there's all this other stuff you need to buy. So I just want to make that clear that this system does include all the heat management ancillary stuff, you know, which is not ancillary. It's part of our system. So it, it's all there. And it's extremely integrated in the control system. It is talking to the process and vice versa. Which helps. And uh, absolutely, there's so much to dig into yeah. on that particular topic and other topics. I see some questions we haven't been able to answer, but unfortunately, we are at the end of our time today. If you have follow up questions, please email us. Uh, you can find me at uh, Emmett M at sci-fi systems.com, John H at sci-fi systems.com. Uh, Clancy and Jason, do you want to uh, shout out some emails or other methods of contact as well? Yeah, I mean, you can you can reach me at Jason at Scientific 710. And um, I encourage everybody to check us out on IG, follow us. Uh, we have a lot of exciting stuff going on, in, including um, the extractor and, and just uh, stay tuned for some big things to come. Find yep. us at MJ BizCon. We'll be right uh, right there. Uh, we Sci-Fi Systems booth will include uh, some equipment from Scientific 710, as well as the wonderful people you see here with us today. So if you have additional uh, questions and you're going to be at MJ BizCon, please stop by the booth, ask us, we can get into the nitty gritty details. Thank you all for your time, both uh, those of you who uh, stopped in to, to view uh, and those of uh, uh, you who have joined us on this call. We look forward to following up with uh, additional uh, webinars in the future, including everyone present. So uh, thank you all and we look forward to seeing you in the future. You can find Sci-Fi Systems at Sci-Fi Systems, uh, Sci-Fi Systems.com. I am Emmett McGregor, and uh, join us again for Plants to Plants. Uh, we'll be having an announcement shortly about our next episode. So thank you once again, everyone, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again in the future. Thank you for your time, everyone. Appreciate Cheers. it. Yeah.